pleasure to introduce our full name, Dr. Charles Russell Severance, uh, who is popularly known as Dr. Chuck, um, <laughs> who is the Sakai PMC Chair and the Clinical Professor of something at the University of Michigan School of Information. But we all know him as <coughs> one of the, the founders of Sakai. and. Um, particularly related to this talk, one of the creators of the LTI standard, which has been transformative in the LMS landscape and achieved adoption across a wide range of products and systems and platforms incredibly quickly for the standards field. And standards are often slow and relatively boring and eventually become irrelevant. And LTI has really bucked the trend, both in its speed and its value and its usefulness. Um, and if you ask Chuck nicely, he'll show you his tattoos. <laughs> um, so it's my pleasure again to welcome Chuck back here again and to thank him particularly for his generosity and time and willingness to travel and come and uh, spread the gospel to people again. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Stephen. It's always an honor to be here. It's, uh, it's, it's fun to kind of uh, use coming to Africa as sort of a, sort of chops time up in a way. It gives me a, a sense to reflect on uh, what all's happened in the past year. Um, so how many people know about the Sakai Racing Team? Yeah, so, <clears throat> so I, 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 I make a lot of money now on online education and um, I decided to get an expensive hobby so I now have race cars and so uh, you can follow it's the Sakai car I made my their Sakai racing team stickers out front that you can get uh, and so we just raced last weekend uh, let me show you a little bit of in-car video of me I think it's this one. Yeah, this will work. racing car that's my new hobby so uh, oh. 
so you can follow the, follow the escapades of the Sakaiger on wheels. It's, it's got ears, right? It's got little Sakaiger ears. It's amazing how many, um, how many people will work on a car for free just for the ability to ride it around a track a little bit. So I got a lot of volunteer workers, including a guy that has a heated shop. He worked for free all winter on both of my race cars. Oh, that's me. Finish the, finish the race. Uh, that's uh, Sunday back last Sunday, so. Um, so there's, there's a, a lot of things that have happened in the last year, and I think about some of the stuff we talked about uh, a year ago. Uh, the things that stick out for me the most is, I talked about Sugi a lot last year, and I talked about how Sugi needed to evolve, and uh, how it had privacy issues, and how I was beginning to question the choice of PHP and Sugi. Um, and the other thing that we talked a lot about was the arrival of Google's cloud services here in uh, South Africa, first cloud provider in South Africa. We talked a lot about Docker and how Sugi and Sakai would work with Docker. And uh, I was really excited to hear when UNISA, uh, when I heard that UNISA went into, uh, I, I, I thought it was going to be the South Africa one, but it's in the Europe one, but the fact that instead of people buying hardware, they can start moving to the cloud, and I think that's really exciting. And I think that open source software like Sakai gives us the flexibility to take advantage of the unique geographical cloud environments in ways that uh, other vendors, other cloud vendors just can't do. And in a sense, that puts Sakai in a position to be sort of using cloud hardware, but using with local control. And I think the future of the cloud is not just giving up control of your data, but actually uh, local control of the data, local ownership, geographically local ownership, laws, et cetera. Um, and so it's exciting to see things uh, that make a lot of progress. So the, the big deal here this year, probably the biggest thing, although if you go back and look at my talks, um, I think for the last two years I've told you that LTI Advantage is almost done and ready to come out for the last two years. It's like hours away. But I think this time I'm not lying. I think that this time LTI Advantage is actually going to finish. We're probably going to have it finished. We're voting on it right now, so that's how close to done it is. Um, it is amazing as someone who's done standards for uh, over 10 years. I mean, LTI was invented based on Sakai. Uh, common cartridge was invented by the Sakai community, and, and in, in 2004, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, we were like alone, and I would just hope that someone would implement these standards, and that's the, that was why I put a tattoo on to challenge all the other vendors. And of course, they, they finally did it, and they found, oh, this is really great. Um, fast forward to this year, um, there is no encouraging. You do not need to encourage Canvas, Blackboard, and uh, Desire to Learn to work on LTI Advantage. As a matter of fact, I find myself at times being the third or fourth one in because Blackboard is just so aggressively getting involved in this stuff. And it's, I'm glad they are. What they don't realize is that this LTI Advantage, we're, we're, we're building it as a bunch of technologists who have designed something gorgeous and wonderful I mean, it is a standard that I'm very, very proud of. OAuth 2.0 and Java Web Tokens that are all modern technologies. LTI was based on a hacked version of OAuth 1 that I kind of had to maintain some of the security code for that. Not anymore. We are, we are behind Google and Facebook have, in, have innovated in Java Web Tokens and OAuth 2 to the point where when I was starting to build the code in Sakai and the code in Sugi to do it, I actually already had the libraries that I needed. I didn't need to add new libraries because we pulled those security libraries in already. So, so that code is the support libraries for all that security is in there. It has an amazing scope, and I, I have to credit IMS on this one. Um, they basically said we were going to build a thing called LTI 1.3. But then they created this thing called LTI Advantage, which is LTI 1.3 launch, uh, deep linking, which is content item, which is a way to install tools externally and search for tools and install them, search for content and install it, a membership service, which gives a full roster to an external tool, and a gradebook service that allows full access to the gradebook, including creating new columns. So an external tool, if given permission, can create lots of new columns, which makes the publishers really, really happy. Now, the ironic thing is, is that this is a good idea, and 
when we first started LTI, there's no way that Blackboard or Desire to Learn would have opened up a wide open gradebook API to let any random tool create as many columns in the gradebook as they want. But the world's changed in all that time. And what IMS did that was so clever is they basically said, you can get the LTI 1.3 sticker, but if you want the LTI Advantage sticker, which is what the cool LMSs should get, you have to do all four of those. So literally everybody who, who complies with LTI Advantage has every one of those things and is 100% compatible, which means that this time next year you can get a roster from Sakai, from Moodle, from Canvas, from Blackboard, desire to learn using the exact same API, as interoperable as LTI is. The uptake is rapid. The spec hasn't even finished yet. And four LMS vendors and several tool vendors have already complied with it. Because part of the deal is you, you got to get some places to, to pass certification before you can release the certification. So it's almost like quality assurance on the certification. You have to be kind of an IMS contributing member. But Sakai, Canvas, Blackboard, and Moodle are already past certification, as are a number of tools. Now, the tools, Turnitin doesn't really have Turnitin, vital source. Sengage, I think, is real and Sugi is real, meaning that they're both real. These are more like uh, test code for some of these others. But it doesn't matter. People were at these meetings. We would have 40 people sitting in a teleconference twice, uh, once a week doing this stuff. This is just us working and me and Canvas and uh, learning objects and IMS and Desire to Learn and Blackboard and turn it in. Like we're just sitting there over and over and over working our butts off, laptops open, code happening. It was amazing, but it is going to be disruptive more than you think. Um, and so if you go to the certification, you see Blackboard, Canvas, Cengage, uh, McGraw-Hill, Turnitin, Moodle, Sakai, Sugi, and Vitalsource. And so those are, those are the ones that are certified right now before the standard is even shipped. So it's really exciting. So the Sakai implementation of LTI Advantage was written by me over the past year and a half. Um, I built it in a way that I saw would give us commercial, uh, a significant advantage. So I, 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 there are many ways you could have done it, but I did it a certain way. So the commercial vendors are all moving toward multi-tenant SaaS, which I think is an effing disaster. So what they're going to do is they, they're trying to save money by, in a sense, not giving every client sort of a little isolated servers and whatever, because it costs money, and they're losing money. Even as much as they're charging, they're losing money. So they're trying to make it so that there's like one big piece of software. You can't install it on your campuses anymore. You'll never be able to install D2L, Blackboard, or Canvas on your campuses anymore. You have to use their cloud hosted, and they're going to put your data in the same databases as everybody else's. That also means that certain things like the user ID key is unique across all instances of all canvases. Right, so in right now, you have a primary key that is your user ID. Well, in Canvas, every school has their own primary key, user 700, and then each, another school has a key, user 700. And LTI 1.1 was based on all that. So when they, they merge all of your accounts into one big database, then you have to change the primary keys of the user accounts, which means that all those tools that are plugged into LTI 1.1 aren't going to work the same way. So what they're going to probably do very quickly is they're going to probably deprecate LTI 1.1. That's not really good because the tool vendors are going to be pretty pissed about that. So, so I'll predict right here that in a year, LTI 1.1 is going to get a lot of negative marketing. Doesn't mean it's bad, it's going to get some negative marketing. And that's because they just want you to kind of throw away all your LTI 1.1 stuff that you did so that they can go to their new LTI 1.3 stuff, but it's really to kind of shield the fact that the vendors have changed their internal data model in an effort to go to multi-tenant SaaS. Sakai and Moodle. Sakai and Moodle have a perfect 1.1 to LTI advantage. I could demonstrate for you a thing where I take a tool and go from LTI and a Sakai. Here's Sakai, they're talking LTI 1.1, and then I can flip them to LTI 1.3. They keep talking and I can flip them back to LTI 1.1. And literally every LTI 1.1 link inside of a Sakai will just keep working, and you can just one at a time, slowly but surely, upgrade them to 1.3. There will be no mass deprecation of LTI 1.1 in Sakai. Now, 
no one's going to care. Like the fact that we did this right and everybody else screwed it up, I'm going to get zero credit for that, but it doesn't matter. I did it right because that's the way it should have been done. Moodle did it the same way. And why is that? And that's because Sakai and Moodle, in a sense, respect the ownership that each school has of their data. Right? We didn't make it so that we said, well, sorry to be part of Sakai, you've got to kind of be part of this collective. No, we're not. Everybody can just run it themselves. They can run it behind a firewall. You're not going to run Canvas behind Ford Motor Company's firewall. You're just not. Because it's got to be connected to the rest of Canvas. Oh, well. Never get credit. So we have been working with everybody. Been doing this for a long time. I mentored people on LTI 2.0, LTI 1.1, and now mentoring people going to LTI Advantage. I have a series of production servers. It turns out with a, the, security, the security arrangements are a lot harder in LTI Advantage than LTI 1.1. So uh, you kind of have to set them up and get a bunch of public and private keys in the right place. And so I have a test Sugi that does LTI 1.3 that's always there, and I have a test Sakai that's always there. And this way, tool vendors can plug themselves into a system. It's kind of like their own QA system. And you can use them too. You can go play with them. So uh, let me do a really quick demo. And like all good demos, it's extremely boring. So I'm going to go to my Sakai server and log in as an end user. Oh, his name is not Hiroku, it's Hiroki. Okay, so this is a happy little Sakai with a happy little new logo. We have some hats. And I'm going to go make a link. And uh, I got debugging turned on. Here's the lessons. And uh, I'm going to uh, do a click. And you will see an LTI. I got debugging turned on. This is, an LT this is all the data that goes across using a thing called JW Java Web Tokens, et cetera. So now we're going to actually launch. So we're, we're leaving from Sakai Cloud to sugi.org, right? But sugi.org is actually configured. So sugi is a PHP application. But I just, on the plane over, I wrote an API that allows Python applications to plug into sugi. And so this is actually not a sugi application. This is a stopping off point inside the PHP code of sugi to go and launch into a Python application. So we are now launching into a Python application on a completely different server. And so now that server is a, now we're running in Python on a third server. And it's got a series of API callbacks back into Tsugi. And I'm going to send a grade back to the Python application, which is going to send it back to Tsugi PHP, which is going to send it back to Sakai. If all goes well. Literally 24 hours ago, this code wasn't written. I didn't sleep on the plane much. So now if we go back to Sakai and I go in gradebook, 44, 44 points inside Sakai. So that's like the most advanced thing that you can see. And it worked. OK. So that's my demo. Uh, so in this Sakai Cloud, that's just a screenshot in case my demo didn't work. Um, you, the other thing I can show you in that, if I had time, was how I can switch both Sugi and Sakai back and forth between, actually Sugi does it automatically. I can switch Sakai back and forth from LTI 1.1 to LTI 1.3, just like that. Nobody else in the world can do that. They're just going to deprecate 1.1 <laughs> is what they're going to do. Watch when they do it, because they suck. Um, there's Sugi Cloud. So now I want to talk a little bit about Sugi, because Sugi's been my play in the next generation digital learning environment. Uh, so over the next few months, uh, I'm going to be sending the message that uh, the PHP version of Sugi that I've got is, uh, in effect, a 1.0. Right now, it's like a 0.7 version, just because programmers always like to version things, not 1.0, because we just don't know when we're done. But I'm getting to the feeling that Sugi 
PHP code that I have. It's, it's just awesome. I got tons of places in production. My whole Python MOOC runs on Sugi. My, my whole on-campus classes run on Sugi. It's great. It does LTI 1.3. It does LTI Advantage. It plugs into Google Classroom. It's great. It runs at scale. It uses EFS and memcache. And I got free hosting. I got a commercial company I founded called Learning Experiences that, that bought you hats and little, little, I spend my money to buy little stuffed animals from China that I brought to hand out stuffed animals. So Sugi's like, Perfect. I mean, I spent five years perfecting this thing. I'm 98% of the commits on it, but it's a damn fine piece of software. But it turns out I was on a long and arduous journey alone, and I ended up at the wrong place. I was completely successful except for one thing, and that is it's written in PHP. That was my only mistake. Five years ago, I started writing in PHP because the University of Michigan gave me free PHP hosting. I'm like, oh, I'm loving PHP. Not only that, I built a whole MOOC in PHP, Web Applications for Everybody on Coursera, which is a very popular MOOC. I was going to train up a whole bunch of PHP developers to work in Sugi and build thousands of web applications. Some people in this room have built Sugi applications. A lot of Sky schools have a little Sugi. They do stuff. Dayton is probably the biggest one. People run Sakai, uh, Sugi in production. It's a fine product, but I'm pretty much going to clean a few things up in the first part of summer, and then I'm going to start a ferocious rewrite in all of Python. I'll talk more about that. Um, I deprecated Sugi Node, which was my attempt to make Sugi. It worked, but nobody wanted to work on it. I have a Python Sugi, which I'll talk about a replacement for it, and Sugi Java, which is a second layer, because Sugi has two layers. The Sugi Util that's in Java, which is based on Sakai's code, I'm actually going to update that, and that's going to stay. And then Django Su Ch Sugi is the thing that I've been building. I built a little bit of a, about a month ago, and then I finished it on the airplane. I finished a kind of MVP on the airplane on the way over here. And so at this point, what I have is this PHP infrastructure. That's basically Sugi, and it's just amazing. It does Google Classroom, does LTI Advantage, LTI 2.0, LTI 1.0, and seamlessly switches between these just with, without even noticing. It, there's a lot of code in there, but it does that really well. And I run it, and it works in all these things, works perfectly, does, supports common cartridge, it supports content item, it supports deep linking, supports uh, LTI Advantage roster, just like frickin' everything. It's like I could retire except for the fact that it's written in PHP. And so the thing I proposed in that building a year ago was that I would build a way to write new applications in Django. And the first thing that I would do would be to build a web service callback. And that's what I just showed you in the demonstration. A web service launch that uses Java web tokens. Then it's got an API callback. It's actually not. OAuth 2, it's actually simple uh, RPC-based API because what I want to do is I want to eventually rewrite all of this in Python so that these API calls are actually inside, internal, not actually over a web service. So I build an RPC-style web service going back and forth that, in effect, remotes all these calls. And I'll show you that source code in a bit. So how did, how did I reach this conclusion? So I teach the world's largest Python course. Here's some of my numbers from Coursera. Uh, four million people sort of kicked the tires on the course. Almost a million have enrolled. Over half a million started it. And 138,000 people have finished it. It's probably the most successful and makes probably more money than just about any other MOOC on the planet. I am personally 5% of Coursera's revenue. They're nice to me. And I did it all using Sugi, <laughs> interestingly. And uh, because of this, uh, Coursera invited me on a sort of speaking tour in India. And uh, like most people, including the Beatles, when you go to India, you come back changed. <laughs> all right, India changes you. you can't, somehow something happens in India. Maybe it's the music. I changed in this room. My whole outlook on life changed in this very room. It was Accenture. So they, they're selling a ton of Python to companies in India and uh, selling a ton, ton of my Python to India. And so I came and so I'm sitting in this room 
And I said, how many people have taken my course? Half those people raised their hands. And I said, I got a great PHP course. How many people want to take my PHP course? Like, two people raised their hand. And then I said, I'm also working on a Django course. How many people want to take Django course? At that point, every hand in the room raised. Every single hand. For those of you who don't know Django, Django is a Python-based web framework. The reason not everybody raised their hand the first time is they'd learned Python somewhere else. The reason everybody raised their hand is that there's no good Django class on the planet. Turns out that in Coursera, the search term that is the search term that is the most common search term for which they have no course for is Django. They got like eight Python courses. They have zero Django courses. So far. <laughs> so this semester, I got to get on a plane in a hurry tomorrow to go back and give the final exam in a class that I call, I roughly call it Django for everybody. We call it Design of Complex Web Applications back at the University of Michigan. But I have built a MOOC. You can go take it right now, DJ free. It's on my little baby learning management system that I built called Koseyu. You can get grades on it. You can take your classes on it. You can earn badges on it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it is the basis of me going on Coursera. As a matter of fact, my Python course is now on edX. And if we get an arrangement with FutureLearn, my Python course is also going to be on Coursera. I mean, on uh, FutureLearn. And that's because all my material is in Sugi, hosted in a learning object repository and an app store. And I plug it in with LTI. And so actually, I can come on to a new learning platform in less than a day. And I did that on edX. So I'm going to soon become the most popular Python course on edX, too. But Django for Everybody has been sort of a religious experience for me. So coming out of that December event in India, I realized that the future is Python. I mean, the future literally is Python. Oh, I should have shown you that picture. Hang on a sec. Let's see if I can find it. So I wrote this um, article on Quora called, What's the Next Big Thing in Python? And you don't have to read the whole thing. But in it, in it I referenced this document that shows the incredible growth of Python from 2012 to present. Uh, doesn't quite fit, but it's 2012 to present. So you see something that in some ways is unprecedented in all the history of technology. In the history of technology, you see like a, a sort of a, a bumping of languages, where language X will get a feature, and a few people will like language X, and then language Y will get a feature, and then they'll do whatever. And you're like, oh, I'm going to do web development, so I'll switch over to PHP. Or I'm going to do you know, artificial intelligence, so I've got to do C++, or I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. So there had been this sort of thing where people go from one language to the other, but they also come back. That's not the case with Python. First off, in that same 2012, millions of new software developers have entered the market, and they only learned one programming language. It's Python. What's happening is because there's so many people that know Python, if you write something in any other language than Python, it's not going to get any update, which means that people are porting all the stuff that they're doing into Python. So Python is truly changing things to the point where Python is starting to eat other languages. It's not a fair fight between Python and any other language anymore. Python is truly just starting to, to wear away at every programming language on the planet. Whether it's Java or PHP or whatever, it's a one-way trap door. People go to Python and they don't come back. They don't say, oh, I'm doing PHP, I'll go to Python, and then I'll somehow find my way back to PHP. They never find their way back to PHP. So. So if I hypothetically were building a brand new open source learning management system today, and I wanted to have a really big community that grew and had people under 45 years old working on it, it would be written in Python and Django from the beginning. I'm amazed at how wonderful Django is. The code that I wrote in Sakai, I built my own object relational mapper called FooRM. How many people have seen the code FooRM? 
Yeah, that's okay. I just I work on it. It's my code. That's my little corner of the world. But I built my own object relational mapper that has cool forms and UI stuff and automatic translation and stuff. And then when I built Sugi, I built my own database management layer and my own form layer. So I've done this a couple of times now. And I'm like writing Python, I'm writing Django, and I'm like, these guys are better than me. They did what I think is the right thing to do, which isn't present in almost any other framework. And so I, I'm really loving Django because they did it the way I wanted it done, and that is that when you build a database model, there's a model that goes to the database, but there's also a UI model that goes with it. So it's a combination of built automatically generating UI componentry as well as automatically generating uh, database componentry. So one of the advantages that Canvas has is in 2008, they built an LMS that assumed LTI 1.1 and common cartridge. It is today the one place where I find it difficult to compete with them, and that is that all throughout their architecture, LTI 1.1 is baked into it. For us, for Blackboard, for everybody else, LTI 1.1 is like an add-on that was not present when our architecture was first formed. Doesn't mean we do a bad job of it, it just means that they do a better job of it. They have more things that they can do with LTI and Canvas than we can. Problem is, LTI 1.1, is pretty much obsolete as of this time next year. LTI Advantage is a shoehorn fit into Canvas. It's a shoehorn fit into everything, but if someone to start building an LMS today, what they would do is they would use LTI Advantage as its internal architecture. APIs, we have a lot of different APIs. We have about three complete generations of incomplete APIs inside Sakai. And they're all obsolete to one degree or another, but if you were building a new LMS starting today, you would just use OAuth 2 and Java Web Tokens as your APIs. Why? Google's using it, Facebook's using it, Salesforce is using it. That's exactly how every API on the planet works. For all these companies that can afford to rewrite their software every couple of years, they're using this API. Because the code in Django is so succinct, far more people will be able to look at the code and contribute to the core of the code base. It's very succinct, it's very easy to read. Python is an advantage in that respect. And here's the thing that bothers me the most, and that is that if you look at Canvas or Sakai in Open edX, they solve completely different things. And even though you might say, yeah, they got a grade book and a threaded discussion, that's pretty much where the similarity ends. But I believe that if you built an LMS today from scratch, you could architect it in such a way that it would be equally suitable for on-campus teaching and learning as well as scalable off-campus teaching and learning. But you have to build it in from the architecture. I mean, Sakai was built in a time where there were 15 weeks and there was a registration and there was a SIS system and all you did was figure out how to plug your student information system into a learning management system and then you're thankful and you move on. But in the future, the, the, who your students are and how they register for courses is going to be different. A system could be written, like Open edX, that understands the fluid nature of new students as compared to what Sakai and Canvas and everybody else. They don't understand the fluid nature of new students, right? So I, I, I would want there to be something that would work as well for on campus and online. It has to be an app store, which means every tool inside this learning management system has to be exportable as an LTI Advantage tool into any other LMS. And it has to be a learning object repository so that once content is authored in this system, it also can be exported in common cartridges and pulled into other learning management systems. So that's what I would do if I were to start building a brand new learning management system today, just hypothetically. So how much time do I got? 10 minutes, 10 or 20, 20 minutes. Well, I'm out of slides. I can do demos. Um, so we have a workshop tomorrow. And uh, so you can either think about, I I'm happy to do anything in the workshop tomorrow, but if left to my own devices, what I will try to do is I will show you something that didn't exist 24 hours ago, and that's how to write Sugi tools in Django. And I will set us all up with Django on the internet, and we will have a Tsugi tool, and we will plug it into Sakai, and it'll all be Python. And we're going to use this thing called, uh, so if you want to get started, here's the instructions for the tomorrow's workshop, sugi.org slash django.txt. 
Um, how many people have heard of pythonanywhere.com? Python Anywhere is dang cool. So Python Anywhere is a free hosted Python web app environment that gives you a URL. I use it in my classes. So all my students have to turn their homework in with a URL. And so they just put it up online using Python Anywhere. And it's absolutely free. I'm going to use it in my Coursera specialization when I do the Coursera specialization. I went and visited them in three, two weeks ago in London. And I asked, is it going to be OK if 100,000 people want to use your thing? And they said, just as long as they don't want to do it all on the same day, I think we're fine. So, so I, I met these people, and they're, they're good people. They got right open source values. They're not trying to make a, a quick buck off of us. So what we'll do is we will make a Python anywhere. We'll do some setup. We'll grab my little Django Sugi application, get it running on Python anywhere. We'll plug it into a production server. And if we keep going, we'll plug it right into Sakai. So everybody gets to, if we do it right tomorrow, everybody should have a hosted Sugi tool written in Django plugged into Sakai. Unless you want to ask me questions about PHP Sugi, which I'm more than capable of answering. Question. OK, now I'll stop. Question. You spoke at lunch and praise of Python. Yes. Now, could you say why you believe Python is so much the future of computing? And secondly, is it simply a momentum due to how many people are using it, therefore how many people are using it, or does it have real advantages? So the, so the, I'll repeat the question. Um, so I'll repeat the question. But the answer is actually, come on. Yep. As a matter of fact, that's what they wanted me to talk about in India, because they're confused too. So why Python? So if you go to Python and say, what's the next, Quora, what's the next big thing in Python? My answer is right there. I wrote this when I came back from India and was per permanently changed, right? Um, so there's a couple things. Um, the first thing is, is that Python is the only language. So if you look at how much time I spend programming, I spend about 60% of my time at PHP last year, about 30%, 35% of my time in Java on Sakai, and about 10 to 15% of my time writing Python. I, I don't write much Python. Um, of those languages, the part that sticks in my head so that I don't have to Google while I'm cut coding is Python. So less than 15% of the time I use Python, and yet I don't need to look up reference. And the reason is, is I know how to find one string inside of another inside Python. In PHP, I don't know which order the parameters are. And in Java, I don't know if the O is capitalized in index of or not. So I can memorize Python. Python is a simpler, more consistent language. And so I, have, I can write Python without looking at the book. I can't literally write any other language without Googling every 10 to 15 lines of code that I write. So you're saying the syntax is intuitive to you? Yes, because, yes, it's super simple. But I mean, and it's not that I'm a dumb guy, right? I know 10, 15 programming languages and been professional. I have programmed professionally in COBOL for a couple of years. And I still can do move corresponding. I mean, I still know about move corresponding. But what I'm saying is I believe that Python for everybody. It's not just I like Python. I think Python sticks in people's heads. And now that I'm going doing more in Python and going back to PHP, I'm like, whoa, this language is ugly, right? It's powerful. I love it. I mean, um, and I, I mean, I don't, I don't wish I never knew uh, PHP, but there's a lot of things that are disorganized in PHP that, that make me like it better. So, but then there's other things that make Python the universal language. Um, the, the method signatures are clean and simple. There's kind of one way to do stuff in Python. There's not 50 ways to do stuff. Um, but the, probably the biggest reason that Python is going to destroy all the other languages is because it has an object-oriented pattern that makes it easy to write native code and plug it into the language. So if you've ever tried to write native code and plug it into, if you ever tried to write code in C and plug it into Java, it is an exercise in frustration because the type system in Java is just so intricate, so complex. The type system in Python is very simple. You got strings, numbers, dictionaries, and lists, and tuples. And literally all of those are rendered internally as method calls with little underscores in front of them. And so what happens is if you want to write in C something having to do with TensorFlow, 
and you want to plug it into Java, you'll never finish. You can't plug it into JavaScript, but you can plug it into Python trivially. If you have some fast C++ numerical library, you can plug it into Java. You can't plug it into Java, you can't plug it into JavaScript, but you can plug it into Python. So if you think of a language like R, what is R? Well, R is a bunch of really fast algorithms with a funky ass language that they made up on a, on a Tuesday evening, right? But if you sl slice that language off and put Python on top of all the R algorithms, now you don't have to teach the stupid language R. You just give a bunch of API calls that are you orchestrate in Python. But it's easier to make R work in Python than it is to make R work in Java or JavaScript or <laughs> COBOL for that matter, right? And so what it is, is it's a way to create a language on top of a bunch of functionality, like a gaming engine. So you, you don't write a gaming engine in Python, you'd write a gaming engine in C or even assembly language, right? Or a real-time system. All these things you have to write in really hardcore languages, but then if you want to orchestrate them, this, Python is a beautiful place to plug them in. You just told me why Python isn't going to totally take over. It needs all those other languages. No, no, no. No, no, no. What I'm saying is 95% of the programmers don't need anything but Python. 5% of the programmers need C and C++. But Java's not long, I think Java's in trouble, right? Java's in trouble, because it doesn't give us much benefit. Um, PHP's in trouble. And I, and I predict, not in 10 years, but in 20 years, JavaScript will go away. JavaScript will go away. That, there, other things have to happen for that. But they tried to get rid of JavaScript with a thing called CoffeeScript when the Ruby people, because Ruby's more elegant than JavaScript was, but Ruby had like a 2% market share at the time, but they were all hippies, and so they all thought they had market, more market share than they did. But when Python reaches 75% market share, it's not unlikely that they would put a Python into the browser at that point. And then you don't even need JavaScript in the browser, because JavaScript's a pretty crappy language. It's a crappy language. There's a lot of things to like about it, but it's a crappy language. So. The other thing that's cool about Java, uh, Python is it's open source. And it's absolutely 100% open source, right? Java is not open source. C Sharp is not open source. Swift is not open source. What would happen if Swift got to be a 75% market share? It'd be the end of the world. They would come to us and like, just take all our money. But if Python ends up at a 75% market share, it's still going to be free. If Java got to a 75% market share, Oracle would be at your house the next day asking for money. So we cannot afford for Java, Java to be that successful. C is open source. C++ is open source. Python is open source. Django is open source. We're at the point where the basics of programming existence, if you start converting to those things, are all open source. I'm not saying PHP is not open source, but I'm just saying that that's that's why I'm placing a giant bet on Python. And so far, I didn't place that bet until that graph pushed it toward me. I don't even like Python. I don't even like Python. I want a language that has an explicit end to a block. I hate that. Curly brace, curly brace. This is the beginning, this is the end. Or I guess you guys see it in mirror image, right? Beginning of a block, end of a block. I love that. Here you got a beginning of block and then you back tab to end of block. Oh, it makes me sick. But okay, so I'm not like a Python fanboy. I'm just unfortunately, we're stuck with Python. It's going to be the thing. Why, why not add that to Python? What? Why not just add that to Python? I, would th I think about that all the time. Any other questions? Yeah. That is a tremendous question. That's a tremendous question. Uh, the question for the, the streaming audience is why not Flask instead of Django? So I, I was told by the curriculum committee uh, a year before I had to teach this class that I couldn't teach PHP anymore. It had to be Python because our poor students couldn't learn another language. So I, but I had a year notice. So I walked around doing a survey of Django versus Flask. And I would ask everybody what do you prefer, Django or Flask? It's okay. You're not going to hurt my feelings. What do you prefer? Pyramid. Pyramid. What's that? <laughs> like Twisted and Tornado and Sanic. Okay. So most people don't say Pyramid. I'll just let you know that when I ask that question. Um, 
It turns out that 50% of the people on average would say uh, Django and 50% of the people would say Flask. And for the people that said Django, I said, what about Flask? And they would say, Flask sucks. And the people that said Flask, I would say, what about uh, Django? And they'd say, Django sucks. So I found this really strange bimodal distribution of Flask people and Django people, and there was really no overlap. There was like no love between them. They're like just partisan. And I looked at that as like, now I don't know the answer. So I changed the question. I changed the question to be, if you had to learn Django and Flask, which order would you learn them in? And then Django is the first to do. I think it's pretty obvious at that point that Django is the place to learn and Flask is the place to go into production. And the key to Flask is Flask is not just Flask. Django is just Django. So you know what Django is, but Flask is a component of a really complex uh, architecture. So if you're, gonna, if you're using Flask in an organization, the use of Flask is far less important than your overall microservices architecture because you've got like 75 little microservices all running in Flask. And now you need a staff of like 250 just so you can explain to each other what the microservices are really doing. But just in, those, in that case, you don't want Django because Django is way too heavy. But if you're building a real application with a thousand open source developers, it's not going to be a microservices architecture because you can't do it. So I'm not anti-Flask. To the extent that people use Flask after that I teach them Django, I'm happy with that. Yeah. Any other questions? Ten minutes? I got a really stupid question. There ain't no such thing. What about 98.7? Why do you say just want to ride over my ears? Okay. <laughs> I'm a user only. Okay. So now, for me, some of the cool stuff that you said is that all the tools are going to be apps. I understood that because I'm an app addict. So that, that was cool. I really don't understand. Frankly, frankly, even though every, even though nothing I said seemed relevant to you, it was all relevant to you. And the reason is, is as a teacher, I want apps. I want to be able to walk into an IT organization, and I want to be able to say, I want an app that does this. I want an app that um, tests for colorblindness, right? And nobody's ever going to write that, so I want to go into the instructional designers, and I'm going to say, can you give me a thing from week three, the colorblindness, I want a little game that we can use to do colorblindness, figure out what they're doing, because I just, that's my thing, I want to teach colorblindness. So the problem today is that I want to make it so that the person that you're talking to to get a colorblindness app made needs as little training as possible to give you everything you want so that I can make a million of them, right? If the only way for you to get a thing done is to get on a plane, come to Ann Arbor, and spend a week in my office, and then I'll write something in C++ and it magically does your thing, then you're never going to get what you want. So I want to make it so we can make a million of these. So the thing that matters is removing the barrier to understanding so we have 100,000 people capable of doing it. And if they're not capable of doing it, I want to have a MOOC that they can take a Python MOOC and then a Django MOOC and even if they started as a, you, a graphic designer, three months later, they can write your application. And then I want to be able to plug that thing in, like, super easy. And that's where Python Anywhere comes in. That's where Django comes in. That's where Python comes in. That's where this whole architecture. This whole architecture means that people can, I want a million people to be able to write these. I figured out I can't make a million people to write these. And that's, the, that's what's caused me to pivot after five years of working on this. Because that was my dream from the very beginning, except I didn't get there. And so this is my new dream. And I think I'm going to succeed in this one. Um, because cause people, people like Django. Even professionals like Django. Because you don't have to be a beginner to like Django, because as a professional, you just get so much more done so much more rapidly. And, um, and so, yeah, that's, that's ultimately the goal. And then to have an app store. So, where's my glasses? I'll do a, I'll do a real quick demo. So I'm going to show you 
in this rather, like, this is a large piece of infrastructure and this is a little tiny thing. I'm gonna show you how you plug a whole new app into the app store that then could plug into all these LMSs. And I'll just say what I'm about to show you didn't work 12 hours ago. I was sitting in the back finishing it up. But hey, that's why I come here. Because I promised you all a year ago that I would do something like this and I did not want to disappoint. So I worked on the plane all the way over. I worked this morning. I worked last night. But hey, it works, so I'm good. So let me do you a quick demo. Uh, testsugicloud.org. So here's the tool that we're talking about. This is the re what I call the remote grading tool because that's the thing. And here's this tool, and I'm testing it. And, and now the tool is running, and now he's going to send the grade back, 0 0.75. Submit. So I made it so that the administrator can go into this system. And we'll do this tomorrow. This is, this is what we'll be doing at the end of tomorrow, is I will be putting everybody's, everybody can write an app and we'll put their own name in somewhere in the app. And it'll be, you know, Sarah's grading tool. And then what I will do to install it in like an entire campus's app store so that there could be, this, this app store could be multiple campuses or it could be one campus. But now I'm, I, so someone came in your office and they wrote a little, they wrote 45 lines of Python. They put it up on Python anywhere and then they go in Oh, no, that's the old code. And this is what it takes to install a Python tool. So I'm installing the Python tool and the PHP stuff that's going to plug into Sakai. You give it a name, you give it an endpoint, where it lives in its Python land, that's a URL to a Python thing, a description, an icon, and then a few little bits about what kind of authentication it needs. And that's it. And then you go out in that tool and you paste this public key into its configuration and then it knows when the launches are coming and then the complex PHP, big PHP software will do all the cra crazy stuff and then hand this, on a silver platter, hand this tool the simplest bit of information it needs just to do its job and a callback. But if that's the number of, that's the, just, it's, it's designed so that like, while your system is running, they could add a tool to the app store by just typing five lines in and hitting the save button and then you could go in your LMS, you go here, and log in as a teacher and go into your lessons and you could say add learning add learning app go to the app store for your campus developers like to leave debug stuff on all the time and that is a tool that your person wrote they didn't even need their own production server to run it. They run it on their own little server, including a free server, Python Anywhere. And then they could they can install it in your class. Click, click, ignore the debug output. And then you have just installed something that quick. First you install it at the App Store, then you can install it into your class. I have a dream. I mean, I had this dream in 1997. It's been a long damn time that I've been questing for this dream. And I'm getting close. I mean, a lot of pieces are falling into place. I wouldn't say the last five years is wasted, even though I wrote PHP, because I understood the nature of the problem. And rewriting it gives me a chance to fix a few things as I go by. OK?
Thanks, Chuck. I've realized the reason we need to keep inviting Chuck to come and present is to keep his development productivity like up to speed so he gets all that airplane coding time in. Um, it's now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Annika Fenter from UNISA. And Annika is a sociologist by training and background, and it's a pleasure to see presentations on the program which come from a theory and research background, um, especially since we often spend a lot of our time stuck in the implementation details, and it's really enjoyable and stimulating to sort of step back sometimes and think around the, the concepts that can help give us more insight into the work that we do. So um, thank you, Annika, over to you. good news and some bad news. The bad news is um, I'm not going to take you for such an exhilarating drive, but the good news is that you will understand what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, really, um, my talk is not really practical, it's theoretical, but I hope it will provide you with a new understanding of online collaborations. So um, scholars have long argued that learning is situated in its social context. One of the core skills of learning is the ability to, to connect ideas and, and, and concepts. And to do that, you need to engage with, with the network. So my point of departure is that learning is not an in-the-head phenomenon, but it's socially enacted. And so social interacts, interactions play a very important role in online learning. So online learning has the potential to provide a social space for students to where they can develop trust and build a community where they can learn together, even when they are from different locations and backgrounds. So the inherent interconnectedness of online learning thus offers the opportunity for collaborative um, engagements. So learning happens in connections with other people, and this enables students to learn more than what they have, would have been able to do on their own. Uh, learning is about giving and receiving. In, in online learning, we see that we are receiving, you are viewing posts as well as posting. So it means that a larger online network offers more collaborative opportunities um, with greater learning prospects. And this is where the concept social capital comes in. So the question is, um, what learning resources are moving through these networks? The answer lies in the social ties that students develop in, in such late networks and how they accumulate resources through those ties. Um, the resources that I'm referring to um, refer to knowledge generation and, and sharing. So it means that the inherent property of the different types of collaborations in networks um, is social capital um, and this refers to the resources embedded in the social structure the accessibility of those resources as well as the mobilization of those resources okay but the mere existence of connections between students does not mean that it will provide for um, meaningful exchanges. Um, social ties only come into fruition when trust develops and when information can flow. So um, it means that students must be able to connect. They, they must have access. They, they must have the, the confidence to, to reach out to other students. And then um, the capacity to, to exchange information um, in, in an environment um, with um, shared values about participation have developed. But what we see that um, participants may have close ties in one group, um, whereas they have weak or, or sporadic ties in another group. 
So the close ties or the strong ties are like bonds. Uh, it's like glue between people in um, homogenous type of groups. Um, those groups are quite tightly knit. Whereas weak ties, um, you can see the difference between um, close ties and weak ties. Whereas weak ties present bridges between heterogeneous groups. But um, both types of ties contribute to the development of social capital in online learning in the sense that strong ties has the advantage that students find support, uh, they build trust with members of their group, they share resources, and they tend to motivate one another. Um, there's also an, an element of closure in, in such um, tightly knit groups. Uh, conversely, a bridging between weak ties facilitates the generation of new knowledge. Bridging ties serve as brokers between previously unconnected points. Um, and this helps to diffuse information between and across diverse groups or networks. So therefore, both types of ties facilitate learning um, shortly. Strong ties in intimate group have a supportive prospect and weak ties in and between groups have a coordinating potential to facilitate the learning. So the efficacy of online learning lies in its potential to accommodate diverse online students by providing opportunities for productive learning engagements. However, incongruity in access to technological resources means that students do not experience the same degree of convenience or closeness. So my question is whether online students at UNISA um, are able to capitalize on the potentially meaningful collaborative learning platform on, on, on my UNISA. So I used a qualitative approach to obtain in-depth um, information from the students on how they responded to the demands of online learning. Um, I need to qualify here that my study um, does not provide a comprehensive overview of the architecture of all possible interactions between um, students on, on networks. And um, the study was also not directed at establishing any causal link between student collaborations and academic performance. It's an exploration and you will understand as I continue. Um, Let me just go back. I also need to qualify at this point that online learning at UNISA is actually a bit of a misnomer. Uh, I might be quite unpopular for saying this, but we have very few wholly um, online courses. The majority of courses are more like a repository um, with a little bit of online support. So I selected one of the fully online modules at university where there is also um, collaborative learning activities which form part of the formal assessment plan. So the students had to collaborate in, in order to, to, to obtain their final marks. So I used the combination of focus groups and um, individual interviews. I, I phoned the students with a sample of students registered for that fully online module. Let's see. My slides are a bit dear my card at the moment. So I can quickly talk about um, the general things um, that, that I found. Um, so the main, um, the bigger part of the responses when students started to talk to me was to complain about this transition from the traditional, more like print-based learning environment at UNISA to, to a more uh, digital environment. One of the students said, Ish, 
it was a shock, this online thing. Sometimes I just sit and stare at my computer. I don't know what to do. They have to do away with this online thing. And then it became evident that there was low participation rates on um, the Mayonisa site, on those groups that were set up for, for the students. So uh, this may support the notion that a large group of UNISA students are cost sensitive and do not have the requisite ICT background, hardware and skills. Um, students explained that um, a large number of UNISA students don't have personal computers or laptops and they have to rely on UNISA facilities or internet access and computers from friends and, and family. So the collaborations in the online group work um, were not generally characterized by frequent interactions and there weren't really fruitful interactive dialogues between the students. Um, the students um, explained that there were a lot of silent students. Um, and it was also common for students to make like non-committal responses, postings like, so things like, I agree just to meet the requisite uh, minimum of five postings in, uh, instead of make, making a contribution. So one student um, was quite exasperated and he said, no, 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 I tried that thing, but it's not working for me, it's just time wasting. Right, so um, the, the other challenge is of course that interaction does not provide for meaningful exchange. Um, the zero history of online students as well as the virtual environment may, makes it difficult for, for students to, to have a, a social presence. One student explained that she was thinking to herself, who are these people? So um, that is a background. There are some students that tell me of some successes. Some students did manage to transition from novice online learners to, to more experienced online learners. Um, they, they embraced the new pedagogy and they um, started, they, they experimented. One student explained to me that after a few attempts, she got clued up and then she started um, collaborating with her peers. So one of these um, students explained that um, the collaboration in that group, she felt that it's a great way of helping each other um, as much as you communicate, you get to know things you didn't know, you get to know others that you didn't know, and it helps you as a person. So a further benefit of collaborating with peers was the development of a capacity for, for self-assessment. One, one student said, you are able to gauge yourself, to see how much you know of the work. It gives you a feeling of how far you are with the study material. So those who engaged with the collaborative work were found uh, or found that, that it helped them to get to know things they didn't know before, it broadened their perspective, it closed gaps in their knowledge, um, and they got to do some reflective work. So although the benefits um, around the satisfaction with learning was real and meaningful, it was not a widespread phenomenon in the formal learning setup. So the high levels of interaction also did not point towards um, higher academic performance. For instance, the students who obtained distinctions did not have very high levels of interaction um, in the group or, or elsewhere. But the results showed an interesting twist, and that is that students used a variety of platforms and technologies in, in support of their learning. Um, their, inter their interactions were not restricted to the formal learning environment, but rather expanded in, in a vast and extensive way in, into in informal learning networks. So I obtained evidence of um, many self-initiated interactions on the on, on informal learning network, um, and, and it included various configurations of offline and online interactions. Okay, so that was what I just discussed. So that picture, this graph shows how the informal inter interactions overshadow the, the formal collaborations. The informal network included face-to-face -face meetings such as offline study groups and the patronage of some private um, 
to tutoring service providers. The online interactions included mostly WhatsApp as well as the use of a social media application called Study Notes Wiki, which is a platform designed by an ex UNISA student for UNISA students. So it's interesting to see that the online students continued to have face-to-face -face study groups. And I would like to add that that was mostly amongst the black students. Actually, I didn't see, I didn't have, I don't have any evidence of any white students that were engaged in face-to-face -face study groups. Um, so, so even though it was an online course, they continued to participate in the face-to-face -face study groups. And these groups meant a lot to the students. They explained to me that it becomes like family. Um, and it's also um, a long-standing type of arrangement. It's, it's not only for that module. They, they carry each other right through their whole university career. So, but almost all of the students were interacting with peers on WhatsApp, different, different WhatsApp groups. So they interacted with people they were already acquainted with, but there's also a lot of evidence that they interacted with um, new acquaintances on WhatsApp. Um, students refer, tend to refer, so a friend referred a friend, you know, that, that type of thing. But WhatsApp is very popular for its instant and just-in-time support. Several students indicated that WhatsApp messages would fly just before um, due dates, you know, assignment dates and examination dates. So the, the widespread use of these more affordable options, such as the um, offline study groups and WhatsApp, suggests that students do try to find a way um, to collaborate within their budget constraints. A number of students made use of the Study Notes Wiki platform, where students um, connect to share resources and collaborate on their preparation for assignments and examinations. One student explained the purpose of Study Notes Wiki was that they would get constructive feedback from, 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 from their peers. Um, some of the students were very active Study Notes Wiki users, and they started to form close ties with people on Study Notes Wiki. Um, and these students tend to go the extra mile for, for one another. Um, one of the keen users of Study Notes Nikki Wiki, which also called her, it's my community, she said that um, they started to developing norms and values around non-contributing members. So if a person's posting showed that they are not putting in any effort, that they are just trying to fish, then they tend to, um, that there's a sanctioning that took place and they, they tried to move those um, students out of the group. Right, so it, the students um, took part on different platforms. Um, they may be part of Study Notes Wiki, as well as having WhatsApp contacts, as well as maybe having some sort of form of other um, study group. So what we see is that the informal learning network complement the formal learning network. This interaction um, provided a type of third space, which include both the vertical, the, for the formal, as well as the horizontal or the informal forms of learning. So it's, it's concerned with what students learn inside and outside the institution. Um, it forms a, a type of alternative comprehensive learning environment and um, it's characterized by coordinated actions as well as deep learning. Sorry. Why? Doesn't. Oh, oh sorry. 
So the concept personal learning environments is, is used to explain this intersection between formal and informal learning. Students are not limited to the formal learning environment, but they move in and across different learning environments. Uh, personal learning environments serve as a single window from which students can track, source, edit, and share their um, learning resources. And it's increasingly important for students who feel that the formal learning environment um, lack the ability to allow them the freedom to present and manage themselves according to their own needs. For instance, several students express the need to be able to personalize their profiles on MyUNISA. Um, one student was very vocal about the fact that she was known by her, her, um, her surname and she would rather have, would like, you know, to be able to have a profile pic, some, some, some sort of profile identity. All right. There are some conflicting points of view about the effect of social networking on academic performance. Uh, some studies have reservations about the positive effects of social networking and whereas others are quite present negative um, results between academic performance and the time spent on social networking um, due to the distractive value. However, there are research that indicates a positive relation between um, social networking activity and academic performance. So we need to distinguish between time spent and the activities. So selected um, social networking activities may, in actual fact, enhance student motivation and their understanding. Okay, so let's see how the concept of social capital can help us to understand how social networks um, facilitate learning. The social ties across and between networks are not equal um, in strength and, and purpose and values. So students may have close ties in one group, whereas they have weak ties across these networks. For instance, we see that students meet one another in face-to-face -face settings at, uh, at a private service provider, then they set up WhatsApp groups, and that is then translated in, into the work that they are preparing to, to submit. So students flit between their MyUNISA groups and their WhatsApp groups and then other social media. So we see that students have both close ties and weak ties. The, the close ties are like bonds between people, uh, and the, the bridges and, and the weak ties are like bridges, um, which connects students who were previously unfamiliar with one another, particularly students who come from different locations and backgrounds. Okay. So the bonds are typical between people who become friends and share some emotional intensity. And we see that there's cohesion in that groups um, and that support their, their learning due to the social support that, that they have. But um, this type of social capital is also associated with intolerance of, of um, outgroup students. And this is what we call network closure. So this closure might sort of immunize them against um, new knowledge or alternative ideas. So those with strong ties, there's the risk that they might just have more of the same and, and not be exposed to alternative views. Whereas the, um, the bridges, which are those widespread or shadow ties between people from different life situations, they provide connections between previously unconnected points, if, if I can put it like that. 
So it's people who are not previously acquainted with one another and typically from different backgrounds. Um, so these, yeah, and this is important because in online settings, people come together not because they have any shared interest, uh, except for being enrolled for the same course. So these brokers fulfill an important role in, in trying to breach that. So the um, theoretical term is structural holes, and that challenged the idea that only strong ties in a homogenous group facilitate learning. I'm proposing that the bridges um, offer more opportunities for, for fresh knowledge or, um, or diverse ideas, which is not always possible in the close-knit group because there's sort of almost like a cognitive login. So um, the, a student's position on the wire network is just as important as the strength of, of his or her close ties. Um, I think structural holes and network diversity is actually more critical for innovative thinking and, and knowledge production. Okay. So students in large and diverse networks have more social capital. Um, they have more opportunities for interaction with a broad spectrum of people. Um, so there's a distribution advantage. It means that there are opportunities for people to overcome their individual working li um, limitations. The larger reservoir of cognitive capacity means that tasks can be divided between members and provide openings to receive input and new ideas from peers, which lead to improved performance. In short, social capital increases the capacity to diffuse information and innovation, particularly in those relations with weak ties um, around structural holes. But the development of social capital in online learning is not without a price. Online collaborations are not innocent, and students have to deal with the social dynamics and the high costs of collaborations in, in terms of effort and time and resources. Um, a prom prominent negative effect includes the management of non-participation by some members. Uh, social capital is not a free-for-all or the next panacea for the challenges of online learning. It requires intentionality in fostering and managing social ties in networks of learning. The issue of non-participation in the form of lurking needs special attention. Although hard-working members could resent non-participants, a, a social capital perspective can explain the value of having lurkers. For the reason that the bridges um, provide uh, those avenues to transmit knowledge between groups that could previously have been excluded due, due to the, the cohesion in, in the smaller groups. Or I'm actually suggesting that students who have more access and have more opportunities to develop close ties might have more benefit than students who only come in sporadically um, you know because they um, be, due, due to costs but because the lurkers um, can tap in to the knowledge that has already been generated, you know, it, it has a very important function that it fulfills. Okay. Um, one of the other risks of social capital in online learning is the exclusionary nature of the network. So in the same way as in the real world scenario, um, one group's gains might be another group's harm or, or as a disadvantage. So Social capital can also be applied in destructive ways. So in the same way that um, exclusive groups are disconnected from the, next, from the rest of the network, um, no, no, I'm saying that wrongly. Exclusive groups that are disconnected from the rest of the network may have inaccurate information, and that can disadvantage members by restricting contact with other 
with other groups. Uh, so social capital may guard um, access to information and deter alternative ways of doing things, and this may create a collective blindness that can result in undesirable consequences. Um, so we think of the role of influencers um, and the potential that the influencers, like, you know, that other blondish guy, you know, and the spread of false news. So this is serious. The artist dude, yeah. Okay. So the development of personal learning environments in which students are able to customize their learning environment demonstrate the role of student agency in online learning. All right. So self-regulated learning is a key factor in managing online learning as students need to manage both the content space and the relational space. Students are not dependent on the formal learning network anymore, but they go out and they seek resources, they make connections with peers, and they manage their online relationships. So the, this finding is supported by previous research conducted here at UCT, which concluded that students make a plan to overcome their structural constraints. Okay. So my study shows that it takes effort and initiative to capitalize on the potential for meaningful collaborations. The role of self-regulation is critical in coordinating the options available to online students. So while the opportunities are there, it depends on whether they initialize that whether in, and use those resources. So what I'm saying is that social capital needs to be activated. So I hope you gained some insight into how social capital have an, influ have an impact on collaborative online learning. And I think online practitioners should acknowledge and capitalize on the powerful intersection between formal and informal learning network and the subsequent establishment of personal learning environments. And the insights might also prove um, useful um, to minimize risks when designing and, and using collaborative learning experiences. So um, I will probably still have more time now. A few minutes, okay. So um, I'm sure as I was talking, you were thinking of some real critical questions or have some ideas for follow-up um, research. Um, so one of the key questions in my mind is the extent to which the naturally occurring social ties in the on, on informal network, how that can be transferred into a formal learning network for real academic um, or measurable academic results. Um, I think another critical question is about the potential role of racial differences in social capital accumulation. Um, I think the South African situation is very pertinent. Um, it will also be very insightful to, to understand that better on how it plays out um, at UNISA. Um, then I think um, a more comprehensive view of the, the architecture of student online collaborations, you know, all possible manifestations of interactions um, and the use of social media, that, that could be very interesting. If one could have such a sociometric view that relates all the, the total picture of student interaction to academic performance. Yeah. Um, then, of course, I think if we can do a content analysis of, of the postings of the students in the online forums, that can also um, provide some um, other evidence of social capital manifestations in online learning. But I would like to hear um, other issues, concerns that, that you have. So the floor is open. <laughs> Alice, are you first again?
In this case, they had a very particular assignment question, and they had to solve a problem, and they were divided into groups by the lecturer, and they had to sort it out amongst themselves. Yeah. Thanks, Annika. I really enjoyed that. Um, the, I just wanted to pick up on your, your statement. The role of self-regulation is critical. How is Yunisa thinking of kind of, um, or how does Yunisa get students to start thinking about self-regulation? I'm actually saying it the other way around. Um, we are seeing that students are managing their environment. They are looking for alternatives. So I'm, I'm seeing okay. already evidence of some self, you know, of, of agency. Okay. So, but so, so how do you incorporate that into the Lurinisa system? Maybe yeah. that's the question I should be asking. Yeah. No, it's a very tricky question. I think it asks for an ethological approach. Um, so we need to, um, it, it, there needs to be a major paradigm shift in terms of acknowledging um, student contribution, you know. And I think to also realize that we cannot wish the informal community away, it's there. And I think all of these things that are happening in Sakai um, is, is already providing answers to, to how we can try and trap into that. Um, on a practical level, the university um, recently um, managed to assign, um, what's it called, Z zero, zero, what? Yeah, the zero rate, zero rate agreements with all the major providers. So students don't need any data to access any of the UNISA sites or any of the sites embedded in that. That helps, and there are, you know, support for students to, to obtain devices. So it's really moving in the right direction. But I think in order to support students more, there needs to be more, um, I think, well-designed scaffolding in terms of providing proper socialization um, periods, um, and also to allow for the fact that it's a development and then students get used to it. Um, when we first introduced um, outcomes-based education like 20 years ago, students were also resistant to that because they didn't trust it. But the moment that they see that um, it's really permanent and if they could start to see some benefits, then they, then they will buy in. So um, at the same time, lecturers have a lot of resistance, but that, that's another talk. Anna-Marie? Firstly, I think if we use um, collaborative learning in a formal sense, so it means that students will, it, uh, their work will get graded. The questions in the first place need to have a high cognitive load. If it's possible for students to do an assignment on their own, they will not collaborate with others because it's the, the, 
investment is too high. Yeah, they, don't, they don't need. So you need to have challenging questions in order to prompt them to, to collaborate with others. Um, then I think if we can have by default, and, and you mentioned this, by default more um, uh, have the approach of having students divided into groups so that they know that it's not this um, massive module where um, they can just try and float um, being undetected so that they would realize from the start for any module that, that I'm registering for, I will be working in a group and there's this kind of accountability towards one another. So I think that will help. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, those are actually two separate things. Um, so you have um, almost like mandatory online group work that is graded, um, which is not to be confused with how students would seek out um, other students to help them in like the uh, in an online cafeteria kind of world. Yeah. Yeah, what? We, we need to just like also acknowledge that students want to have a space um, which is teachers. without the teacher yeah, being there. Yeah, so, exams and assignments as well. Yeah. So, so because one of my, my um, the thing that was so flabbergasting to me is why are they doing all these things that we wanted them to do on my UNISA 
um, why are they doing it on study notes wiki, you know, and none of the reasons that the students offered what there is because this, the lecture is not there, you know, we, we can, you know, so we need to have to accommodate that both ways. Thank you, Annika, so much. Thank you. Thank you.